Plato, Athens, Greece, 428 years before the birth of Christ. So Plato is considered by many the most important and influential philosopher of all time. He is the first philosopher to take all of the three branches of philosophy that we talk about, metaphysics, epistemology, and ethics, and through all of his works, he made a system that combined all of those uh, concepts. So Plato's background, he's one of Socrates' students. He founded the academy, an uh, uh, early school. He was Aristotle's teacher. So on the, on the right, you see a picture from the School of Athens. On the left, you see Plato. He's pointing up. And on the right, you see Aristotle. He's putting his hand down, saying, it's here on Earth. Um, in general, Plato uh, uses dialogues, which we'll talk about, and Socrates, his, his uh, master, his uh, teacher, is the main character in most of his dialogues. Here you see the School of Life uh, painting. Right in the very middle is where Aristotle and Plato were talking. If you look to the left, about five or six people, the guy in the green talking is Socrates. Um, and right in front of Aristotle in the middle, the the guy looking like a beggar in the middle, that is uh, Diogenes, uh, the beggar of uh, Athens, and one of the philosophers which you're going to end up liking a lot. In order to think, you must question. Philosophy in this class in general is about thinking for yourself so that you can find yourself. And to, to think for yourself, you must question what you believe and what those around you believe. Plato tried to use, uh, use dialogues as his form of writing. A dialogue is a question and response writing style where the main character, usually Socrates, his uh, teacher, is questioning others about their value system. In class, um, we're going to use an example of a, um, of a sandwich. What is a sandwich? And, 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 and as, as Socrates goes back and forth. But the idea of this whole dialogue is to make the reader always unsure, 100%, of what they believe in. It always is trying to make you question. His dialogues did not reach a conclusion. Like today when you watch the news, CNN or, or uh, Fox, you see what the bias is. You see how they're trying to make you think, uh, almost brainwash you, manipulate you, condition you. Well, Plato's dialogues were designed to actually cast doubts on what you already think. His goal was what he called aporia. And what is aporia? He said if you read the dialogues, he hoped that you reached a place of being perplexed. Now, why? Who, perplexed means not understanding things. But he wanted you, by reading the dialogues, to actually expand and open your mind to possibilities rather than to close it more because you've come up with the definite answer. The dialogues is the Socratic method in action. In general, he's trying to make people think for themselves. He's not telling them what to believe. And that's what this class is endeavoring to do as well. I'm going to give you two different sides of the issue. You have to come up with what you feel is true. True. Most people just blindly follow their opinions. In other words, they fight for the thing that they've always believed. But in this class and in philosophy as a whole, questioning your beliefs is how you actually open your mind and increase uh, your ability to have wisdom. The Immortal Soul. Plato, right in the bottom, the soul of man is immortal and imperishable. Going back to Pythagoras uh, and the idea of transmigration of the soul, the reincarnation of when you die, something moving on. Plato believed that we are both a physical body and a spirit, um, and that they are separate. Um, and that the spirit, that part of you that hypothetically leaves when your body dies, that's the part that is strongest and vastly superior. In his thoughts, obviously he came so many years before uh, Christianity, his thoughts were very influential along with his student Aristotle in the birth of the Christian religion. The actual quote from Plato, the body is a source of endless trouble to us because of its mere requirement for food. It's liable also to diseases which hinder us. It fills us full of love, lusts, fears, fancies of all kind, endless foolishness. 
What is the source of wars and fighting? The body and the lusts of the body. So uh, the idea is the spiritual life is where Plato and obviously Socrates before him were coming from, while the material life of the body and the collecting of assets and reputation, they held a lot less in high esteem. The good life, Plato. Eudaimonia, this is a concept that's introduced to us in Athens in the, by the ancient Greeks. It's human flourishing. It's being happy. It's what we should try to achieve. It's the good life. It's trying to find contentment so that we have peace of mind. And at that point, we have reached our pinnacle. That was the goal of ancient Greece, Greece and Athens, uh, more specifically Plato, was to try for people to understand the good life and try to reach it through their actions. So ethics is how you should act. Once again, Plato said our goal should be to reach the state of eudaimonia. It's where you are content. It's what the goal of life should be. If you wish to achieve this, point, the meaning of life is eudaimonia. To achieve it, you need something called a reet, which is wisdom, which is knowledge. Wisdom and knowledge of what would be the question, and we will talk about that in a little bit. This has no relevance other than it amuses me. Less than great debates. Plato versus Plato. Now, the Plato character there in the Agora talking, I like the guy in the right there who's actually listing, who's a statue with no arms. Um, but Plato on the left is talking about knowledge is food of the soul. The idea that if we have knowledge and wisdom of what uh, the truth is, what life is, and we're going to get to that with the allegory of the cave, we can achieve this good life, this eudaimonia. So he describes good like a light that reveals the truth. We talked about um, Protagoras and relativism. Relativists, if you recall, believe that it depends. Each person can determine what's right or wrong. Plato disagreed with this. He said some things are right, some things are wrong, and we need to figure out which is which. If we actually look at our value system and what we believe, we can find uh, this eudaimonia. And he said most people, and here's where this is going to become relevant, most people are pulled along by their desires, by their passions. They don't think, they're not thoughtful, rather than actually reflect when something happens, they react when something happens, come from, from an emotional, passionate place. So here's a whole bunch of emotions. Um, the guy in the bottom right, the out of control with the hair and the tongue, I'm not sure exactly what that is. But Plato said that a lot of proud people, he put proud, this is maybe the, uh, the people who are a little bit conceited, a little egotistical. He said they are often prone to being led by their emotions rather than being rational, rather than thinking. How many of you actually have problems controlling your emotions? And this is where all the hands fly up. So, what controls you? Your head or your heart? Wait, hang on. Let's think about this. That's the rational aspect of it. I like it gave him little glasses to make him look intelligent. And then shut up, let's do it. Do this. Yeah, I had a kid a few years ago who kept saying over and over again, just send it, which means stop thinking about it and just do it. Well, if you're a heart person versus a head person, that's probably going to greatly uh, change your experiences on this planet. So I don't know if this is all true, but for the heart people, um, they put greater value on belonging to social groups. You need to feel connected and involved. You rely on your emotional instincts and you're more emotional in general. That people who live with their heart first, um, you kind of you see where they are. They are more emotional. They tend to swing to extremes. The brain people, they want more control. That's autonomy. They have higher grades. They have a higher degree of knowledge, and they potentially have a higher degree of self-control. The allegory of the chariot. Um, Plato uses these allegories, these examples, to illustrate concepts. And here's one of his uh, two most famous, which will illustrate the concept of emotions and keeping them in line with a rational head. So he said we have what's called a tripart soul. Tripartite soul. There's three parts to our soul. And you see the little picture on the right. The rational's up in the head. The spirit is in the heart. And then the appetites is down in the belly and the genitalia.
So his allegory is this. We are a uh, charioteer, and we are being pulled along by two horses. Our soul is combined has these three parts. The logical, the honorable or spirited, and the, the appetites, the desires. And he said we must balance the three of these. So here's a little uh, chart to kind of show you. The rational is the logic, if you're logical. Where does that usually come from? We talk about in the body that's in your head. The spirits, once again, your emotions, having that honor, that victory. Um, and also the negative of the anger and envy of the emotions, the swings. And then the appetites. What are we hungry for? We're obviously hungry for food. That would be the belly. And also the genitalia where, uh, you know, in terms of sexual situations, we have desires that motivate our actions. And then today in society, think about materialism and the need for stuff, how that ultimately is the uh, appetite that keeps us all working, nine to five jobs, TJIF, et cetera, et cetera. Plato said that our soul is divided into these three parts. So in the allegory of the chariot, you have two main characters, and they are horses. First, we have our ugly black horse. Now, I don't think that's an ugly horse at all. And it represents our appetites. It's our desires. It's what we want. If you think about it, unfortunately, and why this horse can be ugly, a lot of our appetites come in conflict with each other. In other words, most people, if you think about the appetites, they said the genitalia and the belly. Well, if you're living the hamburger life and every day you're just wolfing down you know, Burger King hamburgers, you're probably not going to get the supermodel that your genitalia is responding to. And that's one of the problems with this out-of-control desire that our, in our society, I think, probably is a little stronger. The black horse is probably a little bit stronger than the white horse in today's society. Plato said, once again, the belly and the genitalia represents the black horse. Our other character is the noble white horse. It is the hot-blooded part of the soul. It's your heart. Now, what is this uh, horse about? This horse gets angry if it sees something wrong. It's going to right any wrongs. It's going to be about justice. It's ambitious. It's driven. It's desiring to... Um, see everything done correctly, it loves victory, it loves overcoming challenges. These are all positive things. The first one, the black horse, the appetites, we usually say that's more negative. These are all positive, but in fact, too much or too little of either causes problems. The other day, I noticed I dropped a sock on the ground, right? And I picked, went to bend down to pick it up, and I twisted my back. Now, you know the first thought through my mind? I didn't think, ooh. I should exercise more. I didn't think, oh, should start doing yoga. No, I bent down to pick up that sock, twisted my back, and this little voice in my mind goes, oh, no more bending down. <laughs> and I like, I do that all the time. Like the other day, I noticed I dropped some coffee on my bed, and I thought, oh, no girl's gonna wanna come back and see that. I should do the laundry. But that little voice was like, nah, just be lonely forever. <laughs> Problem solved. <laughs> I really hope I don't drop my keys, because then I'll be homeless. <laughs> That's what's gonna happen. Like, it's, it's weird. It's like there's, there's a part of me that wants to do great things, and part of me just wants to be lazy. Like, I wake up in the morning, and part of me's like, yes, let's win the Nobel Prize. But then another part of me goes, okay, as long as we don't have to get out of bed. <laughs> now, I'm all for curing cancer. Just don't ask us to get dressed. <laughs> That's the problem. Uh, Plato actually wrote about this. Um, we all know Plato, yes, uh, famous ancient Greek philosopher. Uh, he invented the idea of a platonic relationship. Uh, that's where a guy and a girl are just friends, and the guy pretends he's cool with that. Uh, <laughs> some people being in platonic relationships, good. But Plato said there's two sides of us. It's like, it's like we're a chariot being pulled by two horses, right? There's a dark horse, and that's your laziness. There's a white horse, and that's your spiritedness. There's the driver, and that's your logic. And there's the wheels, and... Well, they're just wheels. <laughs> not, not everything's a metaphor. <laughs> but the driver, logic, has to find a balance between the two horses, between ambition and laziness, right? Like, you could have a little black horse, but not too much, you know? 
You, if, you, if you eat a slice of pie, that's fine. If you, and if you eat another slice of pie, that's cool. But if you eat a whole pie <laughs> off a stripper, <laughs> too much dark horse. Too much white horse is bad as well, right? If you, if you go to the gym, that's great. If you work out, that's fantastic. But if you start telling people about your workout, too much white horse. <laughs> you are boring people. Right? And it can't, it can't be all one horse. Like, you have to have some dark horse. You can't be constantly like, no, no chocolate bars. No, no drinking. No, no fun. Because then that horse, eventually, it's just going to break loose. And then, bam. You wake up in a hotel with Charlie Sheen. <laughs> the rational mind is the charioteer. It's the head. It's the part of us that's trying to control these two horses. We need to analyze. We need to realize our desires, how strong they are. We need to sort of rein it in. We need to figure out what is best. Plato said our head needs to do this. It needs to balance out these two horses. Well, what's the problem? The problem is neither of the horses are good or bad. It's great that we have appetites for things. Our desire for things motivates us. If, we, if you were told that you couldn't have any assets or you couldn't make any money in today's society, you probably would become more lazy because in our society, the motivation for profit and materialism is what motivates people. So the horses aren't necessarily good or bad by themselves. The problem is too much of one horse, as the comedy bit shows. The job, if we want to keep our horse, horses and our chariot on the road, we need to always try to balance these two horses. And the only way really to understand if you've got one horse that's too strong or, or, or not is being reflective and understanding your desires and understand when you're driven so hard by your white horse that you're driving yourself insane. Plato's epistemology theory. Now, epistemology is the theory of knowing. It's usually not as uh, exciting to students as metaphysics or ethics. Plato was a rationalist. He said we know things through our head, and that's how we figure these things out. He said we understand concepts um, that were almost were brought with us. He talks about school as being recollecting things that you had forgotten from your previous experiences on Earth. In other words, soul reincarnation. He said that most of the things we take in from our senses are unreliable. And people are way too easy just to hear things. And the old line is, do you believe everything you read or believe everything you hear? Well, most people do. Most people have long since lost the difference between opinion and fact. All you have to do during this election cycle is watch any news station. What's being taught to you is opinion. What's being, what's being spoken is generally not fact. In fact, there's a lot of lies involved, but there's a lot of opinion. Do you believe everything you re hear and read? Well, today you better have developed that capacity to understand bias because most of what we take in with our senses in terms of facts are opinions, and oftentimes they're wrong. He said most of the ideas that we've accepted that are common sense just don't make any sense at all. I mean, think about, you know, you go to court and you got to dress up with the, the suit and tie and there'll be somebody in the front, the judge, wearing a big black robe. And we're okay with the black robe. We just accept that. If you, if you rewind, the black robe originally came with a white powdered wig. So the judges would wear these white powdered wigs. What the hell is that about? Or to be well-dressed, to really want to do well, you don't want to look like a bum when you're at the at the courtroom, so you would have a piece of cloth tied around your neck that we'll call a tie, and now you're well-dressed. Well, what's that about? Or what are high-heeled shoes about? They're just torture devices, women walking around in stilts. He said, ultimately, if we actually examine what is common sense, we'll find a lot of times it's just foolishness that's been passed along. Plato's theory of forms. This is one of his more famous theories um, that confuses kids for generations. So, Plato said that the real world that exists, we don't see it. In other words, our senses, our five senses, maybe more, they take in the real world, but all he said we're really taking in is a poor copy of it. We're intellectually trying to understand through our senses the world. He said um, that the, there exists an ideal 
for everything that exists. So in other words, instead of just uh, lots of chairs, there is an ideal chair. There is a form for an ideal chair, and we have an idea of it the, in our heads of what an ideal chair would be, or ideal anything. He said the world is separated from these ideal forms that only exist in our heads and the real world that we see. So, there's an example. In our head, we have the ideal horse. I don't know that it's a green horse kicking back like that, on a, broken away from the carousel. But he said we have these ideals in our head, and then when we look through our senses, we can see other horses, and those are two different horses, and we understand them to be horses. All right, let's confuse you a little bit more. So, at the very top of this chart, you have the concept of beauty. And beauty exists in the theory of forms. If you notice, it's up in the clouds. It's on a different astral plane. It's not something you can see. But when we're born, we take in the concept, the second uh, bracket, the man with the little thought bubbles. He's understanding the idea of beauty because the ideal form of beauty exists up in this plane. And then in life, we see examples of beautiful things, and then we see imitations in the form of pictures of beautiful things. Plato's theory of form says that on a different astral plane, there are these concepts that only exist in our minds through the form of ideas. This is the real world, not what we see every day. So what is this? And this, and this, and this etc etc these are all what we would call chair so with the theory of forms you understand what a chair is you recognize a chair even though you've never seen these particular chairs the one on the left looks kind of cool i don't know if that's comfy or not even though you've never seen these types of chairs you understand what a chair is because of the theory of forms an ideal exists in your head on a different intellectual plane that allows you to recognize all of the imperfect things that our senses will take in. This is a difficult concept to understand. It's the concept that obviously is going to lead to the idea of ideas, which are concepts that only exist in our minds. It's not as applicable as the theory of um, the allegory of the chariot or next class, the allegory of the cave. But write a journal on your thoughts, and we will see you next time.